We're going to save those last five slides for Monday night. Because I have to get through this one. Huh? Yeah, you can forget it for now. <laughs> Go ahead and do 95 Monday night. Okay. So welcome back to chapter 3 of our series, Proving the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now in chapter 1, we identified and spoke briefly about the difference between believing something happened versus knowing something happened. Um, in chapter 2, we looked at a few historical facts that non-believers really cannot deny. One of the majority of, his, of historians, they do accept the fact that many people did claim to see Jesus alive uh, after his crucifixion. But we also saw how one of the critics, he claimed that it was only visions. But we know that doesn't work. Mass visions, hallucinations, mass hallucinations are scientifically impossible, so we know that doesn't work. But that's not the only reason. Reason. The only reason why that they can't use visions to try to explain away the facts that hundreds of people saw him. Almost everyone was that when someone claims to, to see a vision in that sense, we all know it's not real, right? We know it's their imagination. And so let's ask the question. Did anyone in the first century actually accuse those First century eyewitnesses that it was only in their imagination, that it was only a vision that they saw. Did anyone ever challenge them that it was only imagination? That's why you thought you saw Jesus. Did anyone ever do that? Was there any record of that? Did anybody say, no, it can't be this? You only, you only think you. Did anyone ever sue? There's a lot of stuff written by his enemies. Even people calling themselves Christians. A lot of Christians, a lot of them written in the first century. But there's no record of anyone doing that, claiming that they only saw visions. That accusationization is a modern critics in our, in our day, in our time. But here's what's interesting. We do have a record of someone, someone being accused in the first century of having a vision. Yeah. I mean, not, not, any, of those, not any of those hundreds of people who saw Jesus. I'm talking about one individual actually was, was accused one individual accused and said, it's impossible for you to see him. Impossible. You, you only saw him. You, you're seeing a vision. Or you're, or, or you're, or is. That sound familiar, guys? Huh? Yeah. You remember the angel uh, when he freed Peter from the prison? He shows up there at the, well, let's read it. It's in Acts 20. He shows up at where the brethren were, were praying. When he knocked, this is Peter, when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. <laughs> She's excited. What does she do? She doesn't even let him in the house. She goes back and tells the others, Peter, Peter's back, back, he's here. What did they say to her? Let's read it. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it, it's his Joe. <laughs> You're crazy, Rhoda. I often wonder why, why did my, someone come up to us? Would, really? <laughs> For reason that we doubted, we, wouldn't we go to the door? They didn't do that. You're crazy, Rhoda. No way. And she kept saying, I saw, I saw him. They, did, they didn't believe her. Why? Can't be Peter. That's what they were saying. Before we go back to that, it's not unusual then for a person to hear of someone having a vision of someone else soon after that pride or they don't know what happened to them. It's possible. It just doesn't happen very often. In fact, I personally know of someone. You know one. You might. Have, she, in fact, she was a, she's a cousin of mine. And her mother passed away, my aunt passed away, and it wasn't until long after that, after that, she tells us, we're sitting down, and she says, Mom appeared to me last night, I saw her. She was in the bedroom. We all looked around, we knew she was a little crazy. Whatever it was, illusion, hallucinate, whatever it was, we know that it wasn't really Aunt Lou standing there in her bedroom. It was imagination, right? Now, so it's possible, it's possible to hallucinate, but you have to be in a special Mental status, under special conditions, under certain conditions. 
You really need to miss that person a lot. You had to have a close emotional um, relationship with that, per that person, a, a very emotional state about the death of that person. So in that kind of mental condition, it may be possible. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Uh, but it could happen. There's nothing wrong with it. it there's, that's the mind playing that, that game. But everyone knows, knows the imagination. It's not the physical person, right, that's standing there. It's just an imagination. Nobody ever think that that person, Aunt Lou came back from the dead. No one ever, she didn't even think that. My cousin, she knew that. By the way, as in a way, as in, you know, it is possible that the brethren thought Peter was dead. I mean, don't forget, Stephen and Philip, they were just recently martyred, right? They were killed for preaching Jesus Christ. This was second, Peter's second time that he was arrested, and they strictly warned him. That's possible. I'm just saying, it's possible that they thought he was dead. I mean, why else would they be so adamant about it? <laughs> that he's actually, it's only his ghost. I, I don't know, but I'm just saying. So maybe it's possible that um, people can think they see somebody maybe, that, no, someone did, did die, pass away, they can think they saw the person. But we all know that it's only an imagination. It's not something real. And in, in any culture, we know that. Every culture knows that. When you see something like this, they could be hallucinating. You could think they're crazy, crazy as they do it, but nobody thinks that it was the real person standing there, especially in the first century. Because in the first century, we realize how adamant they were against resurrection. That's not the right way to say it. They did not accept resurrection as a common concept like you and I do. No, no, no. This was, this was a foreign concept, totally foreign. At least in a culture, we could pick it up and read it, and we can understand it, but it was foreign in, in that church. No way. It's impossible. The Sadducees, Sadducees, they didn't believe in anything in spiritual. They didn't believe in anything in the afterlife. They didn't believe in angels. No resurrection. You're crazy. See, Pharisees, as you know, they, they did believe in a resurrection, but that was the final resurrection, right? the last day. They didn't believe that an indeed that an physically reversed death and come up and stand in front of you physically. No, they didn't accept that. It was not something that they were going to accept, that an individ individual actually be raised from the grave, grave, come out of the grave. It was a foreign concept altogether. They were not going to accept it. It was baked into their minds from birth. It was so baked into their minds that even Christians in Corinth that we just talked about were having a hard time. No, there's no such thing as resurrection. That's what Paul is fighting, right? Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? That's what they're saying. I'm trying to stress that point. It's foreign to us to think that way. It's foreign to them to think our way. No, resurrection is an impossibility. They knew Jesus was raised from the dead. Their faith was based on that fact. But they, but they couldn't, the connection that it meant them too could be raised from the dead. Why? Because resurrection from the dead, you're dead, you're dead. It never happens. I'm trying to give you an understanding of the mental worldview of everyone, Christians, and gents, non-Christians. They all had this concept totally foreign to them that you and I just accept. We understand it. They couldn't, they couldn't make that shim. It was a hard con concept. Too hard to accept. Foreign. I can't say it enough. Am I saying it too much? I want to get that point home. You remember when Paul was preaching uh, to those philosophers we saw in the last lesson in Athens? He was mocked. They made fun of him. And what about the time when he was making his defense in front of a king, Agrippa? Remember, and then Festus stands up and he says, Paul, you're out of your mind. Because he was about what? A man coming out of the grave. Resurrection was a hard sell. You can't sell it. Doesn't make any sense to them. Resurrection? No. And then, then, keep that in mind, how hard of a sell this is. Because in that mindset, this, in that world, it seems like out of nowhere, this new religious movement just exploded on the scene. From nowhere. The whole world was being, what is this? 
in that, in that environment. Keep going. I mean, I mean, not seem to explode out of thin air. It did so against all those odds that we're just talking about. And there's other about, and there's other about, but those odds, resurrection's impossible. And yet this movement, like an, an atomic bomb, and this has been documented by enemies of Christ. Enemies of Christianity has documented these things, these things. I'll introduce to you Cornelius Tacitus. I'm sure some of you have heard of Cornelius. Mr. Mr. Tacitus, he was a Roman senator. He was an orator, uh, meaning a speaker. He was a great speaker, but he was also a great historian. And I'm sure you might have heard of the books he wrote. It was called The Annals of Imperial Rome. And in that book, he writes about the six-day fire that happened in Rome. It devastated the city, Rome. Happened in 64 AD. I used to say, it happened in 1964, because that was my era. No, it happened in 64, no 19 in front of it. That's when it happened. It's historic. It's there. knows about it. And he mentions how Nero started giving support to the homeless, because a lot of people lost their homes in this ma 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 magnificent fire. And he started rebuilding the devastated city. And then Rome rumors started, started, to, occur, started to pop up. It looks, it looks like Nero started this fire. Well, what does any good politician do? <laughs> they did it. He darts the attention away from himself and pointing his attention and guilt towards others. And guess who the others were? Christians. We started the fire. That's what Nero started proclaiming. They're the guilty ones. And that's when he started, started persecuting Christians. This was the first major confrontation between the Roman Empire and you, Christians. Little, little less Christians. Rome. This is it. Nero. This was the big one. It started. And we know that because Tacitus wrote these, wrote these things in a history book. Mr. Mr. Nambu, you're going to want to read this? Because this is not biblical. This is history. No one denies it. Read what he said. Uh, consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations. <laughs> you were bad people called Christians by the Pope. Isn't that interesting? Wasn't that interesting? Wasn't it to give them a new name? We'll save that for another day. He goes on to say, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme pen penalty, notice the fiction, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procreators, Pontius Pilatus. And so he's acknowledging that, he's, he's reckoning that the origin of this new movement was because of this Christus, Christ, Jesus Christ. And he collaborates then uh, that they were executed during the reign of Tiberius. And I say he collaborates because we already know that from the Gospels, right? Uh, Pontius Pilate. And then he goes on to say this. In the most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, moment uh, broke out not only in Judea, the, the first of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. <laughs> you believe in a mischievous superstition. You guys. That's what he's saying. You're evil. That's the mindset of the first century. And it broke out over there in, there in Judea. It's over there and it comes all the way over here in Rome. Oh, wait a minute. It started over there in Judea, ends up over here in Rome as he's writing. As he's writing. So th when did he... When was this historic happen this history happening? Well, he started in 64 AD is when he was talking about the time period. So how many years did it take for, for this movement to grow to this size from Judea all the way over here in Rome? 30 years. Less than 30 years. 1,500 miles as the crow flies, or as if you took an airplane from Judea, over there to uh, Rome. And if you're lucky to have an SUV in those days, you could have taken a 2,500 mile trip to go around, around because they didn't have cars and we know that. So how long, how long did it take if you were to walk it? And yet this movement grew to that size in 30 year, years against all these odds that we didn't even talk about yet, all of them. Yeah. He goes on to say, accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude, multi that's a lot of people, an immense, immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. 
Guilty, Lance, Lance, against Manton, next. What a crime. Oh, he goes on. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths, covered with the skins of beasts. They were torn by dogs and, and perished or nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. I complain when I stub my toe. Look what these guys are facing. Our brethren. For what? Crimes against humanity. Do we realize what was going on in the, in the first century? Do we really know what was going on? So Tacitus, he's collaborating these first three points about Jesus, that Jesus lived, crucified, and the movement started based on his name. But he's also mentioning this, that the movement erupted it erupted, started out from Judea, and ended up all the way over here in, in a short, short time in Rome. He also talks about crowds of Christians. This is a crowd proud to me. But he's talking about bigger crowds in Rome. Why? What we have here is testimony that from an enemy of Christianity. He's not trying to promote it. He's just given the facts as he, as he sees it. He said Christians are evil people, people. Now when you think of evil people, you, some things come to your mind. Mind, Christian mind? No, not, not in our mind. They're their minds it was. So when you have testimony like this from an enemy, what does that tell you about this massive movement growing in such a short period of time in the first century? What does it tell you? It knows for sure that this movement was, movement was not... It wasn't in, in, uh, uh, evolved over hundreds and hundreds and centuries. No. Just from the enemy of Christ. I was told that it, that it was it many times. Where's the evidence for that? I'll show you evidence here, though. This was in the first, in the first century. It started in an environment that was hostile to it. Are you facing any hostile style environments for your beliefs today? Maybe a little, not much, but wait, we can return. It happened then. Be ready. That's what this is all about. This is historical evidence, fact, that this new movement overnight exploded and started. It grew in a way unparalleled by any other movement that man has ever done, has ever done, paralleled, especially under those conditions. What could have been responsible for that? You've got to ask the questions. That's a fact. These are facts. What could have been responsible for this explosion? I ain't going to tell you. <laughs> you know the answer, but we're going to look further. Because Tacitus was not the only, the only one who said things like this at that time period. Meet Lucian of Samosata. You ever heard of him? He's a Roman also from the mid-2nd century. Oh, he didn't like Christians either. He was not a friend of Christian at all. He, in fact, he was extremely sarcastic towards us, towards Christians. He considered you guys, you're a misfit, every one of you. You're misfits. This is what he thought. Let's read it. Oh, before I do, but this, I want to say this, though. Besides saying this about Christians, he knows you guys pretty well. He knows what makes you tick. Yeah, let's read it. I've got behind my slides. He knows what's common among Christians. The, the Christians you know, worship a man to this day, a distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account for their novel rites. They are. You see, these misguided creatures start with the general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the, con the content and voluntary self-devotion which are common among them. Not only are you guys misguided, look what else is common among you. You start with this idea that you're going to live forever, immortal. Crazy people, people. What's interesting, though, is modern skeptics will tell you and I, a guy becomes a Christian first, and then we're brainwashed. And over some time, we end up, some of us, start thinking or believing, believing that mortal. That's what modern critics tell you. have been brainwashed. That's what they'll tell you. But here's a guy who knows them firsthand. 
But he says, no, 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 no. They start with that conviction first. It wasn't the end object of their faith. They started with that. And he knows that it's been this man that got crucified. Yeah, it's all connected because he didn't stay dead. Whoop, I gave that away. But he knows what drives Christianity. He knows what motivates those misguided creatures. They think they're immortal. They start with that idea. And this is what's really important. It's common among you guys. Where are you? Have you thought of that? Is this common among us? It was among them. They're going to fake. No, I don't count death. That was them. He recognized that with, without fear of any kind, the har horrible that they are brethren faced. I didn't know until I did this study how dangerous it was for the first 300 years to be a Christian. It was risky business. You risked everything being a Christian. For what? What? I mean, you could lose your, not only your home, your family, your job, and everything else, which we have evidence of. We'll look at that later, later. But you can lose your life because of, of your loyalty to Jesus Christ. You show up here on a Sunday, you're going to jail. That's the way it was. The way it was. So I'm going to let some critic tell me that this movement was invented. It was never raised from the dead that they just made, just made these stories up. I'm going to let me that when I see this. Of course not. Why would they make this up? Because they like this? They like this idea? No. No, their trust in Jesus allowed them to face death, death at every turn. I sometimes look at myself and say, do I have that courage? I sing songs praying for it. For it. And you're risking everything for what? You weren't gaining anything, nothing material, nothing political, nothing cultural. You lose it all by come, becoming a Christian. This is recorded history. This is from the enemies of Christ very early on, the first century. It didn't evolve over a hundred years. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get to one of those misfits. We have evidence of one of those misfits. Ignatius, I'm sure you heard of his name. He was a bishop uh, in, the church, in the church, Antioch. He was martyred. He's one of the misfits, but yet he was martyred uh, at the beginning of the second century. Uh, here's a man who displayed that contempt for death that Lucian recognized is in every Christian. So after being arrested, uh, Ignatius was being transported over to Rome where he was, where he was going to be slurred in the Colosseum. And while he was on his way to Rome, Ignatius writes a letter. A letter. I don't know if you have a chance to read any of his letters. He wrote a number of letters. But he wrote a letter expressing his concern, expressing his, his fears, his desires, what, he, what his thoughts were. And it's, a, it's a very interesting letter. I'm going to read just a paragraph of it. He said, I pray that nothing on heaven or earth will prevent, prevent me from attaining the goal of Jesus Christ. Let me subject, I'm sorry, let me be subjected to fire, the cross, fights with wild beasts, having my body cut and torn apart on, on the rack, my limbs mangled, my whole body crushed, any of the devil's cruel tortures, just, just as long as I attain the goal of Jesus, Jesus Christ. What's he excited about? Dying that kind of death. To gain, gain the goal of Jesus Christ. Talk about a misfit in the eyes of Lucian. When you have this kind of phenomena, ha phenomena, phenomena happen, you have to ask, why? Why would anybody, would you put yourself through that? I mean, it, no, of course not. But why did this happen? Why would he be so excited about things, things like that? He wasn't worried. He was, he, was, he was excited that he didn't want to make sure I missed, missed being, receiving that goal. He was willing, willing to sacrifice his life, proving his loyalty to God. He wasn't proving it to anybody else. He wasn't in it for the money. This is collaborating evidence that supports what Lucian recognized all his options have. Yeah, this is what was going on in the first century. Individuals living according to their faith, putting their faith where their mouth was. 
or something like that. You know what I mean? These are historical facts about the horrific conditions at that time in the, in the first century, about Christians who live, our brethren who lived under those conditions. And so what we have, actually we act so far, coming from two sources. One is uh, the Christian sources themselves, this one felt Ignatius, and we also have it from the second source, uh, Roman historians, enemies of Christ. I mean, this is how Christianity was described in the first century. You mean it's not peaches and cream? Because this movement faced the most severe cultural, economic, political kinds of evil conditions. I'm only putting it mildly. What they faced. Why? Because they confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and they could lose everything, lose life for what they believed in. Here's, a, here's the point. Under such horrific conditions, this movement grew, grew like wildfire. It became one of the most, the world's most largest religion in the world. world. But how? Christianity should have failed, brethren. It should have failed under normal, normal because first of all, Rome, remember? We saw that, I think it was lesson, I forget which lesson. Rome invented crucifixion, which did more than just destroy the man. It ruined his reputation, it ruined his, his mission. It, he was, it was over. And we saw the, the evidence of that with that piece of evidence of Alex of Menenos, uh, Alex of Menos. Not Alex You know, the, that graffiti that we talked about, Christianity should have failed because of these things. And then second, for both Jew and Gentile, Resurrection, impossible, not an option, impossible, was not in their worldview at view at all. We're all fighting that among the Christians in Corinth. Christianity should have failed. Then third, then third everyone hated them. Rome hated them. Get to that slide. Not just Rome, but the populace hated them, the neighbors, your family, your friends, everybody. You were atheists. And you know what they do with atheists in Rome? They terminate you. They get rid of you. Atheists are not acceptable in Rome. In Rome. That's you. Got to remove this evil superstition, this thing called Christianity. It should have failed. You see the point I'm trying to make? It should have failed. But it didn't. Obvious. It didn't fail against all those horrific odds. You've got to keep asking your questions, especially in front of non-believers. Why didn't it fail? It should have. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then how could have this happened? It couldn't, couldn't have happened unless Jesus Christ came out of grave. Don't let anyone tell you that someone invented this whole thing because the evidence, the facts of the, of the case going on in the first century doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And I want to close with one last story. I think I'm going to make it. It's a true story. This one, this one we're going to look. But it's one that has a different ending in the story than the one, I don't remember what lesson, I think it was chapter one. The statistics were 70% of our young people are giving up Jesus Christ, going off to, off to college. This one has a better, end, better ending. It's a true story. It's about... A noble woman, noble woman, a woman by the name of Perpetua. Perpetua. Young Christian lady, 20 years old, young woman. That be, she was a noble woman, and that means that she was from a, from a very wealthy family. She was living good, but she was a martyr. She died. She was executed in Carthage in the Carthage in the big third century. This young 21, no, 20 year old woman. Here's a painting, I enlarged it, I enlarged it, see that this painting has uh, people surrounding her. They really don't, they're not angry with her, they're pleading with her. Um, the young man next to her, to her, Tolerinius, I think that's how you say his name, name he, he was a governor and he had the same office as Pontius Pilate. He had the authority off the head. This was his job. But he didn't want to, he didn't want to really execute her. He's begging her, he's pleading with her. Perpetua, just make the sacrifice to our God, Caesar. 
Give your, your duty, the duty. Bow down. That's all you got to do. And you can go home. You can live. The old man sitting to her right is pleading with her. That's her father. He's saying, daughter, think, think of your father. My, my gray, have, have pity of your gray-haired father. Give up your pride. That's what he's telling her. The governor says, look, says, look at your sisters there. And think about your father. Who's going to take care of your father when you, when you die? Think about someone else, not just yourself. The man on the left there, he's holding an official document. And you would get that document. When you paid the taxes, when you paid your, your sacrifice to Caesar, you would get this document that you did so. All you got to do is pay that. It's, it's, you, you have, it's like a receipt that your sacrifice was given. You, but you see, to a Christian, that, that's no option in doing that. To, to, to her Petru, Petru, who's now at this time, she says, no. I'm not going to give up my Lord. I'm not going to mock my Lord, Jesus. It's unthink unthinkable. And this is what made it harder. harder. While she was in prison waiting for her sentencing, but I didn't kill you. It wasn't fast. I want you to men mentally go through more persecution mentally as well. But while she was waiting for her sentence, she gave birth to a little baby boy. And the governor says to her, think about your baby, your little boy, Perpetua. What's going to happen to him? Now, keep in mind, you've heard of infanticide. Yeah? Infanticide. Today we call it abortion. Infanticide today, they just throw a baby on the heap of garbage. You don't want the baby? That was society. That's the world. We live there as Christians. What about your baby? What, you know what's going to happen. She's, he's pleading with her. We know these things because she kept the diary in prison, and we found the diary. And the painting was ba based on all the things. This is some of the details. But it's based on all the things that she wrote, 200 AD. She could have freed herself. She could have just choose, choose, pay the Sacrifice to the God. But she chose differently. She wanted to remain faithful to her Lord Jesus Christ. But she chose something different instead of paying her dues. In fact, someone had to finish her diary. She couldn't finish, take her diary out there with her. With her. So someone else who finished her story. And there were other martyrs included in the ending of her story. Let me get that quote up. This was the ending of the story. It says, the day of their victory dawned and they marched from prison to the amphitheater joyfully as though they were going to heaven with calm faces, trembling, if all, with joy rather than fear. Contempt for death was so common among Christians at that time. The enemies of Christ recognized that. I wonder if my friends even know I'm a Christian. Maybe I'm not, sh not showing myself as a Christian as much. Content for death. All you had to do was, do was call your Lord, and then you can go free. Every Christian, by the way, had the opportunity to defend himself in court, pay the, pay the dues, you go home free. Most of them didn't. If you did, most of them didn't. They didn't. They chose this instead. That's real. This is, this is what happened if you claimed Jesus Christ is your Lord. This is what happened. This is fact. Our brethren went through this passage is like, oh, death, which was read a little while ago. Where is your victory? Where is your sting? I have a whole appreciation for that passage now. This is real. They went through this. Why? That's the question. It's the question. For anyone that's a non believer here, you have to ask why. Why would thousands upon people, thousands upon thousands of people go through, through that? I don't have an answer for it. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, there's no other answer. 
This is factual, historical events about something about this man, Jesus Christ, that changed not only individuals, it changed the world. Ask them why, how? Don't be on the end, on the end where they're cha challenging you and answer the question. Ask them. Here, here's, the, here's the evidence. By the way, I'm gonna, all these recordings will be online. Line. Your iPad out. Why? Ask them why. There's no explanation for this. If Jesus was not read, raised from the dead, there is no logical explanation. This evidence, it defies logic. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, from the dead. am I repeating myself? I'm sorry. This is the evidence. If Jesus was not raised, was not raised, and boy, I can't wait till tomorrow night. We ain't seen nothing yet. Nothing yet. The evidence that exists that most, most of us don't know about, that where they don't know about it. Evidence that will show you beyond a reasonable doubt that, that he was raised from the dead, and you can know it as a fact. We have assurance that he is sitting right now as the Savior at the song. I'm telling you, we didn't even set this up. The song just fit right in. That song you sang, Jesus is our King, he's our Savior, he's sitting up there right now, and he's offering that same resurrection to eternal life that he, that he experienced, never to die again. Every one of you, us, all of us, He's extending that invitation because he came out of the grave. The only thing I got to do is to remain faithful, like perpetual. That's all I got to do. Thank you. What are going to do with this evidence? Especially when we get to the rest of it Monday, Tuesday. You got it with this evidence. Thank you.